Thursday night and you're watching this week's edition of Crypto Trader on CNBC Africa, the world's first televised cryptocurrency investment show. For those of you who watched last week, you'll remember that we had Ari Paul on the show and we ran out of time, but there was so much more that we wanted to ask him. So I got him back on the show and uh, I really want to dig into what he's doing with his new venture called Blocktown Capital. Ari, welcome back to our show. It's always good to have you here. Um, Blocktown Capital. Who is Ari Paul and how did Ari Paul get into Blocktown Capital? So I started my career as a trader where I traded Forex, commodities, bonds, uh, equity derivatives, kind of you name it. And then more recently, I was a portfolio manager for the University of Chicago Endowment for four years, which is kind of the other end of the investing spectrum. It's long term investing, risk management, portfolio construction. Um, when I was at University of, Chicago, University of Chicago, we were constantly talking with my colleagues about how hard it is to earn an attractive return in traditional assets today. It's a low return environment. We were talking about how are we going to earn 7% a year? And I was investing in Bitcoin my, and cryptocurrency myself and trading it and earning great returns. And it felt bad, right? It, it's, it's, I wanted University of Chicago to be able to benefit from this. But what I realized, this was a year ago, what I realized was University of Chicago and other endowments and institutions could not invest. They needed the right platform, the right vehicles that they could feel comfortable investing in. And so I left University of Chicago and I partnered with my co-founder, Matthew Getz, who left Goldman Sachs to provide an investment vehicle that endowments and pensions and other institutional investors could invest in so they could harvest the gains that we were enjoying. I imagine when you talk about an endowment that you're talking about this conservative group of people who are talking about returns of four, five, six percent. Now you walk into their office and you say to them, you've got this asset class which is returning in some cases 30,000%, 5,000%, 3,000%. How do they respond to this? First, everyone's afraid. It's not just a fear of loss because an endowment that is $8 billion, they could put $10 million in investment, right? And that, that isn't really risk to the institution, but it's risk to the investor. The investor, the individual, the portfolio manager who underwrites that investment, they're scared that they're going to look stupid or they're going to get, you know, they're, maybe they'll get fired. But what happens very quickly is fear becomes FOMO. So once a competitor, once Yale or Duke or Chicago or Harvard put in a small investment and do really well, suddenly all of their peers, all the all of the other institutions, they're not afraid of, of losing 10 million. They're now afraid of not making 200 million. And so we're almost at that stage. We're almost at the point where people are more afraid of missing out than they are of the loss. So you got this thing where you don't have a track record and you're investing in this wild west asset class, for lack of a better word. How do you get around the fact that you don't have a track record? So the reality is I do show my personal track record, but really what I'm trying to use to convince an investor is my experience, my, my whole history as an investor, as a trader, as well as um, really showing that I understand the market, explaining how I think about it, how I how I set up trades, where where our alpha comes from. I think that's really more convincing. Tell me about how your fund makes trading decisions. Is it a fundamental fund? Do you invest in existing tokens? Do you invest in ICOs? What do you guys actually invest in? Um, so we're, we're more active focused. We only have a small allocation to ICOs. Uh, roughly, we target something like 10%. Um, our, I, I, I have nothing against buy and hold or venture capital focused. It's just I'm not a venture capitalist. I love thinking about where this market's going to be in five or 10 years, but it's so volatile. I see the shorter term opportunity. And for me, that my, my background as a trader, uh, which you know I, I spent six years doing professionally, is to take advantage of those shorter term opportunities. By shorter term, I don't mean five minutes. I mean more like call it five days to five months is the time frame I'm usually looking at. Um, and so we're focused on on capturing opportunities that are a little shorter term in nature. And the way we do that is it's a mix of, of really three different things. We start with fundamentals. I never want to be on the wrong. I never want to invest in a buggy protocol. I never want to invest in a broken business idea. Um, but then I also want there to be a catalyst. I want there to be a reason the thing is likely to go up. Why is everyone else going to suddenly agree with me? So an example would be Monero is being integrated into the ledger. That's going to the ledger is a hardware wallet. That's going to make Monero a lot easier to store purely. And that's a catalyst for, for people to be more willing to own it for the price to go up. And then the third is we do look at things like quantitative signaling and technical analysis to help us to, to choose entries and exits. So let's say you get a, a buy signal, for example, and you've got to execute on a buy signal and you've got you know, a multi-million dollar fund. Now, I know that when I get a buy signal and I want to buy something on Bitfinex or Bitrex, I struggle to do this in my personal capacity because of a lack of liquidity. So how do you go about this for a fund? I mean, surely liquidity is a, is a big issue for you guys. So the first thing is you need to be accessing as much liquidity as you can. So we're not trading on one exchange. We're trading on 
uh, eight exchanges as well as four over-the-counter desks, and we'll be onboarding to more exchanges over time. So that's the first thing. Second, having algorithmic execution is very valuable. So if you have to manually click on an exchange and you have to buy every $10,000 worth you know, yourself, it's very difficult. If you can click a button that will work in order for you over the span of four days automatically with a little bit of smart execution, maybe it sends the order to the exchange with the lowest price. Maybe it's looking at the volume and the liquidity and trading of each of that token. It makes it easier to accumulate a position. Um, and lastly, we are constrained by liquidity. It is a real issue. So. Our, our sharper trading, if we're swinging tens of millions of dollars around in, you know, in a span of a few hours, we mostly have to be doing it in the largest cryptocurrencies. These software programs that execute on, on transactions automatically, have you got these programs? Do they, do they actually exist in the crypto space or are you still writing them? We hired a programmer to write those for us. Um, we're not an algo trading firm. We're not cut, we don't claim to be cutting edge on this. We're mostly just using traditional uh, algorithmic execution tools that exist in at every hedge fund in traditional finance. I mean, this sounds like a dream job in a dream sector, in a dream company to work for, with a, quite a cool boss, not the best boss in the world. But on a more serious note, how many people are in your team and are you looking for more people to join your team? And if you are, maybe our viewers can get in touch with you. So we've got a team of seven right now and we're, we're, we are hiring. Uh, and something I'll say that so our next hire, we want to be fluent in Japanese or Korean because this is a global market. I'm a monolingual idiot. Uh, I have a, a stellar investment analyst who works with me who's fluent in Mandarin. And, but you know, Japan and Korea are, are, are a growing part of this market. So if, if any listener is, is fluent in Japanese and Korean and ideally is a blockchain engineer and or a seasoned trader, you know, find me on Twitter and, and message me. So I know there's one side of running a fund and that's you know the trading and, and, and the, the getting of the money, et cetera, but there's also like a dirty side of running a fund or the not so fun side, and that's the admin. Tell me a little bit about the admin. Is it, is it, is it a tough thing to do? Kind of, so, so we use a fund administrator. Um, the fund administrator is, is responsible with calculating our performance every month and calculating how much money we have and verifying that we have the cryptocurrency we say we have. And the, the administrator sends a statement to our investors every month. Um, what's a little bit more challenging and what requires our involvement is we do work with the fund administrator on any quirky issues. For example, to value uh, or to confirm possession of Monero. Right? Monero is private by design. How do you do that? We work with the administrator to make sure they have all the information they need to confirm our positions. Um, and then working with investors. So when an investor wants to invest, they have to go through anti-money laundering and know your customer laws. Uh, they do that with the administrator and, and often that requires our involvement a little bit. So you're running around now and you're raising money for the fund. Um, is it private client money that you're raising? Is it institutional money? Um, who qualifies to actually invest in the fund? Is there a minimum? So at the moment, our minimum is a million dollars. Um, and, and frankly, the, it's challenging to accept a lot of small investors. It's expensive because every investor has to go through this anti-money laundering process with our fund administrator. Every investor requires extra accounting resources, administrative resources, um, as well as our time. Our right investors, we they, they have the right to talk to us. And so if I, if I had 400 investors, I wouldn't be able to invest. I'd be talking to people all the time. Um, so we, we, you know, we, we have a, a minimum and, and frankly, we'll probably be raising that soon. Um, our investors have mostly been venture capital firms, family offices, um, and high net worth individuals so far. Over time, we will start. Uh, we will start inviting endowments to invest as well. Ari, in this uh, landscape where cryptocurrencies are like the hottest thing in the world, and it's an asset class which is returning more than any other asset class, are you finding a lot of competition? Say, a lot of other funds looking for money, or are you in a lonely place? There's a growing number, but each fund is quite small. There are very, very few large funds. So you have a lot of funds that are launching with ten or twenty million dollars. So we view them not as competition, but as, as it's very collaborative. So every day I talk to a fund manager and we trade best practices on security. We talk about uh, service providers, like which fund administrator, which legal firm should we use. And we also discuss our best ideas. Because at the moment, the professional money managers, people like myself, we don't control that much of the crypto market. Most of the cryptocurrency market is the passive retail investor, the person who buys a Bitcoin on Coinbase or maybe sells because they heard Jamie Dimon call it a fraud. Um, and so the, the, the funds, generally we feel like we're more collaborating and we can all win. I mean, cryptocurrency went from 15 billion at the start of the year, total market cap, to 170 billion right now. Plenty of room for everyone to make money. Best practices, I love the fact that you use the word best practices. 
If our viewers want to know what your best practices are, maybe give us a few of these best practices that you talk about and some of the ideas that you're sharing. Uh, well, let's see. So on but best practice, a, a key key element is it's, it's not sexy, but counterparty risk and security. So any dollar you have on an exchange, any Bitcoin you have on an exchange is at risk. It's easy to forget, but a huge number of cryptocurrency exchanges have been hacked or, or the, the founders ran off with the money. So one, be very careful with how much, how much counterparty risk you have to each individual exchange. Ideally, if you have to have cryptocurrency sitting on exchanges, try to spread it out and, and just be aware that you're taking real risk there. And then with your security, for most people, I would recommend using a hardware wallet. Get a Trezor or a Ledger, make sure you have a, a secure backup of the seed. And that's a pretty, that's, that's the best kind of happy balance between security and, and convenience right now. 2X or not 2X? That is the question. And that's the question that's moving the Bitcoin price up and down. So I got Jimmy Song back and we're going to ask Jimmy about his views on 2X. Jimmy, welcome back to our show. Uh, 2X, didn't we all go to New York and sign an agreement at consensus saying that 2X should be implemented? Well, some companies that were at consensus 2017 agreed that they would uh, try to do this as uh, representatives of the network, but by no means was there a consensus. Uh, there were a lot of companies that didn't show up to consensus 2017. <laughs> Uh, there were a lot of developers and certainly users that didn't get a say in any of that stuff. So it was really sort of like an industry that uh, sort of thing that where they decided, hey, we're going to try to push this. Um, and it uh, consensus doesn't really work that way. You, you need everybody to upgrade in order for 2x to work. What happens if we don't get consensus and we don't get the upgrade? Well, we're going to have two chains. We're going to have a legacy chain and a 2x chain. And uh, who knows how that's going to play out. Although, you know, I guess uh, the Bitfinex futures market gives us some indication. So now you're in this position where you've got Bitcoin, you've got Bitcoin Cash, you're going to have Bitcoin Gold, and you're going to have Bitcoin 2x. Who's going to win? Uh, my gut feeling is that the one that didn't hard fork ever is going to win. Uh, just from futures markets and stuff like that. I think on Bitfinex, it's currently trading at around 0.85 of one Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, people seem to think that Bitcoin core is the one that's most valuable. Um, there are some questions as to whether or not that futures market is really representative of the sentiment of the entire community. Uh, but that's, uh, that's the best information we have right now. Jimmy, what is 2X? What is it? actually do? Why are so many people against 2x? Well, so what it does is it doubles the block size. And uh, from sort of a conceptual point of view, it's fairly easy to understand. You have right now an average of a little over a megabyte blocks. It would probably double as a result of, uh, of a 2x hard fork. The reason why people don't want to upgrade is because it's contentious. Um, there's There are people that think that SegWit and Lightning should be given a chance to uh, prove their scaling properties of, uh, you know, scaling ability, if you will. Um, and they, do, they don't want, they don't think it's, uh, it's a safe hard fork at this moment. Um, and it was sort of like this deal from consensus and they don't like that. It was, uh, it was done by a bunch of companies and didn't get as much input from users and things like that. And they'd rather uh, not upgrade. And that's sort of the right of every Bitcoin node is not upgrading. And if you don't upgrade, then you don't go with that chain. We start to split the chain and by splitting the chain, surely at some point we weaken the chain. When does this all become destructive? I, I imagine some of the, uh, the mining hash power will move over to 2x. And in fact, uh, a bunch of miners have, are signaling right now that they will mine 2x. Um, but again, who knows how much of that is going to be true. If the price is really low, it's there, a lot of them would be mining at a significant loss. So it, and you know, if uh, Bitcoin uh, has a much higher price, then it's going to be extremely profitable to mine there. So um, there's, there's some uh, question as to how that's going to play out, but it will definitely affect Bitcoin and perhaps even Bitcoin Cash since they all use the same proof of work. Uh, on a personal note, which chain would you support? Would you support the implementation of SegWit or would you support the non-implementation of SegWit? The big thing about 2x is that right now, uh, as of this moment, there's no replay protection. They did implement an opt-in replay uh, replay protection a couple weeks ago, but they 
uh, reverted that because there there was a flaw that was found with respect to sort of payment channels and Lightning. Um, I, I I'm not really I, I don't really have um, opinions on that per se, uh, except I, I think the market will figure it out and I'll go with whatever the market uh, thinks is better. And um, I, I somehow don't think it's uh, likely that uh, 2x will be that hard fork, but that's that's just my opinion. Jimmy, uh, one last question, and it's going to be the last question because I know after I ask you this question, you may want to hang up. But with all that's going on in Bitcoin, with Segwit2x, with Bitcoin Gold coming up, with the whole argument as to how to increase the transaction volume, etc., why not just use Bitcoin Cash? Yes, use Bitcoin Cash. You've got eight megabyte blocks. You've got cheap transactions. You've got minor support. Why not just use Bitcoin Cash? Yeah, because uh, your current tools won't work with it, right? Like if you're using a particular wallet, uh, unless they happen to support Bitcoin Cash, and I think only a few do, um, you're not going to be able to use it. Um, and if you are already on Bitcoin, then then you're good. And part of the reason for that is because, uh, you know, Bitcoin Cash implemented strong replay protection. And by implementing strong replay protection, you require sort of everybody else to upgrade, including wallets, exchanges, merchants, etc. Um, and 2x, uh, the reason why they're not implementing uh, strong replay protection is because they want to bring the entire ecosystem along with them. They want uh, all the wallets to continue working because they believe, uh, you know, they'll be the majority or they'll be the unified uh, Bitcoin going forward. Um, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin Cash has some limited use cases, but until you have sort of the ecosystem around you, it's not quite as useful. You're, uh, you need that network effect and that network effect includes all the different players on in the ecosystem and that's probably why not as many people use it right now in this week's ico review we're going to be reviewing a company that's built and based on south african soil a company from back home trisha martinez is the founder of walla and they're doing an ico trisha why are you doing an ico what does walla actually do thanks for having me walla is a mobile financial platform for emerging market consumers built on the blockchain now, there are about 3.5 billion consumers globally who don't have access to financial services. We created Wall after doing years of research on the ground with consumers in emerging markets. We've grown to over a million people who've joined our community, and we've tested an incentives model with them to understand what their problems were. Okay, so let me break that down yeah. into a few questions. So first of all, what kind of financial services are available in Walla today? So Walla brings financial service providers and value-added service providers to our platform along with consumers. Products like savings accounts, loans, insurance, remittances, bill pay, topping up, everything is housed in this platform for a consumer. But it's not your own services, so you're aggregating services and yes. offering them to clients. So you're kind of acting as like an intermediary, right? Exactly. Think of like an Amazon for finances. Okay, so where are you guys active at the moment? Is your app actually live? Yes, so we started by building online communities to understand what these financial barriers were. So we've actually grown to over a million people in 100 emerging markets, but the product is currently live in Uganda. And in Uganda, are people actually using the product? They are. So we're in a slow closed uh, release right now with a few hundred users, but it's growing very quickly. And the type of financial services that they can get on the platform, what kind of financial services are they? So we actually have announced a few partnerships in the last few weeks, which we're excited about. So soon consumers will be able to get savings accounts, current accounts, loans. They'll be able to send money to friends in country and out of country, bill pay, top up, all those types of things. So actually like you're an aggregator of financial services and you can yes. keep adding financial services as the demand grows for the financial services. Exactly, yes. So why a token sale? So the biggest barriers in financial services that we've observed after years of research are the costs and access. And the only way to really enable um, low cost financial services is on the blockchain. So we actually are issuing a crypto token called DALA that will enable low, near free instantaneous transactions thanks to the uh, RAID network. And how does the DALA fit into these near, near free transactions. Yep, so Walla is actually the launch partner of Dala. 
So when a customer signs up, they will be rewarded for positive financial behavior through dollar tokens. And in the platform, they can redeem these dollar tokens for value added services like airtime data. They can send remittances and they can use them with banks as well. So it's a financial services incentive program using a token. Exactly. What's the value of the token for the people that hold the token? So if I buy your token on the ICO, what, what's the value to me? What's going to drive that, that value of the token up? Yeah, so a lot of people who are participating in the token sale right now see the value in that we already have a million people who have signed up. There's 3.5 billion consumers who are in serious need of financial services. So in the immediate term, consumers will be rewarded with dollar tokens, but over time, we're going to be bringing in financial service providers who will be buying those tokens and using them themselves. Okay, so the banks and the financial services guys are actually gonna use the, the dollar tokens to incentivize good behavior on exactly. the platform. Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> so when does your ICO open or your token sale open and where can our uh, customers or our viewers go if they want to get involved? Great question. So the pre-sale and registration are actually open right now. So people can go to tokensale.getwallet.com to go learn more, read our white paper and register. The pre-sale will go until the end of November and the public sale will uh, open the beginning of December. So if people get it in now, they can sign up for the pre-sale, right? Exactly. Oh, awesome. And who are your investors or your early stage investors? Who are your partners? Yeah, so we actually are backed by a handful of really great, strong investors. So we actually went through the Techstars Accelerator in London. So Techstars is one of our backers, as well as Newtown Partners, which is Lou Clayson and Vinnie Lingham's and venture Lingham. fund. Yeah, we love Vinnie Lingham yep. on the show. He's, he's, a, big, uh, he's yeah. a big part of our show. Yeah, both of them have been on your show. <laughs> great. So if you want to get involved, then uh, you can get involved right now in the pre-sale phase of the dollar token. So even with ICOs not being able to raise as much money, the ICO that we're featuring in our ICO review this week actually may raise the amount of money that they're looking for and pretty quickly. And that's because what they are is they're an existing business that's doing an ICO. They've got a great existing business. Sebastian Serrano is the founder and CEO of Ripio. Sebastian, what do you guys at Ripio actually do? You've got an existing business. What does the existing business actually do? So we have a Bitcoin wallet in South America with more than 100,000 active users, uh, mostly between Argentina and Brazil. And we do Bit, uh, Bitcoin wallet, we have an exchange and do payment processing. Sebastian, South America seems like the perfect market for cryptocurrencies. I mean, you've got a whole lot of currencies, you've got a lot of people that are unbanked, you've got high inflation, you've got big currency devaluation. Is the market for crypto big and growing in South America? So there is uh, more than 600, 600 million people in South America and 65% of the population is unbanked and doesn't have access to financial services, formal or semi-formal. So there is a huge population that needs service and, and crypto can lower the cost of giving them access to financial inclusion. So there is potentially hundreds of millions of, of people that could be uh, empowered by this technology. Okay, so I understand your, your existing business, but tell me about the ICO that you're doing. Is that an ICO for the existing business or is that an ICO for a new business? No, we are doing a token for, we're selling a token for a new network that is going to be connected to our business. Um, but the token is for a peer-to-peer -peer credit network that will allow connecting lenders and borrowers across the world. Peer-to-peer -peer lending is essentially me loaning money to someone who lives somewhere else. How does that work practically? If I'm living in South Africa and I want to lend money or loan money to someone living in Argentina, how does it work practically? Yeah, so there is a, um, a lot of potential into connecting through blockchain people in different jurisdictions. It will bring a lot of liquidity and capital. But at the same time, it has a lot of challenges. You can have like a lender in China and a borrower in Brazil. And if the borrower in Brazil defaults, what does the, the lender that is in another country do for collection? So in order to solve this, what we are doing is we're introducing a new agent into a network that we call the Cosigner. The Cosigner is a local entity that has collection capabilities that can do refinancing and can reach out uh, to the to a borrower at default. So uh, what this is going to do is it's going to, have to bring protection to the lender 
and if the borrower defaults, then the cosigner will pay the lender and they will go after the borrower. So if I lend $100 to somebody in Argentina and they don't repay my loan, who's responsible for the loan? The person that took the loan or the cosigner? The cosigner will pay the, the loan to the lender uh, and then it will own the loan and go after the, um, the borrower. And you can see as a, as a lender, uh, you're going to be able to check how healthy is the cosigner. As all the loans are in the blockchain, you are going to see how much exposure they have. And looking at their proof of funds in crypto, you can see how much leverage they have. So this brings a lot of transparency into the network. And it will be easy for lenders to judge how, how good the cosigner is and how healthy they are. Okay, that's a really, really interesting concept, but what's in it for the co-signer? So the, the co-signer works kind of like an insurance, so they will charge uh, an interest, uh, a fee, uh, which will be a percent of the interest rates. And what they will have to do is they will uh, have to charge enough to cover the default, mean, uh, less the, the collection that they can do. Cool, so you're doing a, an ICO, what's the use case for the token? So in the network, there are many agents um, and there are identity providers. There is an oracle for pricing. Uh, there are the scoring agents, there are, there are the consigners, and they, they all get gonna get paid in these tokens as a fee to a toll to get access into the network. And also the loans itself are gonna be settled uh, using the token. Sounds amazing and exciting. When does your ICO open and how much money are you trying to raise? So we are uh, doing a token sale for uh, the remaining part that we don't, didn't sell on the pre-sale on October 24. So we raised most of the funds that we were after, looking after on our pre-sale to um, funds and accredited investors. But we also want a lot of users uh, to participate and be engaged with the network. And we are raising about 20,000 uh, Ethereum in in the crowd sale on on next October 24. And if our viewers want to get their hands onto your tokens, where can they go? Uh, you can go to ripiocredit.network and learn a lot more about the technology, the product, and how it's uh, going to be used and the utility that it brings. If you haven't been following my Twitter at CryptoManRun, suggest get onto my Twitter. This week I've been tweeting live from Las Vegas at the Coin Agenda Conference, and next week I'll be tweeting live from Ethereum DevCon in Cancun. Until next week, happy trading.